One of the biggest questions that I have gotten from our community is how to understand humidity and how to understand watering better. As we are in the depths of winter now, humidity is a big topic and focus in our plant care routines, and you're going to hear a lot about it today with this nerdy deep dive with two fabulous planty podcasters, the daddies of the Plant Daddy podcast, Stephen and Matthew. They are lovely, and I knew that I couldn't find better guests than these two guys. They're such wonderful plant nerds. They're so brainy. They do so much research. They're so knowledgeable. And they might be the only other two people in the world to get as jazzed talking about humidity and weird plant things than me. So this conversation was supposed to be 40 minutes long, and it ended up being 90 minutes because we just couldn't stop talking about plants and winter and dormancy and humidity and problem solving. And I hope your inner plant nerd sees the inner plant nerd in us and this conversation and just smiles and feels seen. So welcome back to season six. Kick back, cozy up with your plants, and enjoy episode 112 of Blue Mangrove Radio. Thank you, Territorial Seed Company, for supporting Bloom and Grow Radio. Territorial Seed Company is enabling gardeners to produce an abundance of good-tasting, fresh-from-the-garden food 12 months a year. They have an unbelievable selection of seeds and plants to choose from to build a garden of your dreams and prides itself on selecting and growing seeds for the best-tasting, best-producing, highest-quality vegetable flowers and herbs we could potentially grow. Check out their amazing variety of seeds, plants, garden planters, and more at TerritorialSeed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout to get 10% off your order. Once again, that's TerritorialSeed.com. Code BLOOM10 gets you 10% off. Stop wasting time on plants that don't fit your lifestyle, plant friends. Take the Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test to unlock your inner plant parent potential. When you take the free quiz, you'll learn about your plant parent personality, and the coolest part is that you get a list of recommended plants, DIY planty projects, and Bloom and Grow Radio podcast episodes specially curated for you by yours truly. Go to bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality to take the quiz and let me know your results on Instagram. I cannot wait to see them. Plan friends, welcome to season six of Bloom and Grow Radio. I'm so excited to be back after a quick little break. Billy and I moved, which is a big thing that I will share more about with you later. However, I am just so excited for it to be 2021 and to be bringing you so many amazing conversations that we have down the pike. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes we've got because they're amazing. And I'm super excited in 2021 for this little podcast glow up that we've got going on. New season. I am always trying to continue to improve the audio quality of the show and the listening quality of the show for you guys. So you might have noticed the new music. We've got some fun ukulele iterations of the theme song that you'll be hearing throughout season six. We also have a new podcast ad format that you're going to notice, which I created to be a little bit more intentional about how you guys hear the ads as to not disrupt from the conversation chunk of the episode. Instead of doing them after the intro into the conversation, you're going to hear them more kind of seamlessly integrated within the podcast, like, you know, the real professional podcasters do. One other thing about our sponsors, we have the most amazing sponsor partners in season six. I feel like the luckiest podcaster in the world to be able to work with these companies who have products that I all adore. So consider supporting them if their products and services resonate with you. And if you do, make sure you use those fierce discount codes to obviously get the discounts, but it also shows them that you're coming from us, which helps us keep blooming and growing as well. Special thanks to our newest Patreon supporters, Erin Hall and Ashley Campson. Thank you so much for joining the community of Patreon plant friends, this beautiful community of listeners that support the show monetarily on a monthly basis. I am so thankful to you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you are interested about potentially supporting Bloom and Grow Radio and becoming a Patreon plant friend, you can click the link in the show notes for more information. Okay, so Stephen and Matthew of the Plant Daddy Podcast are so awesome. This conversation is so amazing, and it is lengthy. So I am going to dive right into the conversation. So welcome, Plant Daddies. Plant Daddies, Stephen and Matthew, welcome to Bloom and Girl Radio. Hello. Happy to be here. 
I am always thrilled to have fellow podcasters on the show because there's something just about talking to other podcasters. You know the grind, you know the tech, you know it all. So I'm thrilled to have you here today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. You are the daddies behind the Plant Daddy podcast. I just adore how freaking nerdy you guys are. (laughs) We wear like a badge of honor. (laughs) Yeah, we have fun. We try to restrain it, but only sometimes. Okay, so Yeah, I feel like only in the plant space in this really specific niche of the world is being like, oh my God, you guys are so nerdy is such a good compliment. You know, like you take that with the utmost excitement. I'm just glad that in my 30s, now there is like a place for that because I was a really weird child. (laughs) You've finally grown into it, Matthew. Yes. 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 I would describe myself as very intense. And I feel like there's there's an outlet for the intensity now, you know, with throwing myself into this. (laughs) Exactly. That's so awesome. Well, before we dive into winter plant care and all things humidity, and I'm so excited to nerd out with you guys because I know this is such a confusing and necessary topic for our community, I want to know more about you guys a little bit and how the Plant Daddy podcast came to be. So can you each tell me a little bit about how you became the plant parent that you are today? Matthew, you want to start? I mean, I feel like I've kind of been a plant daddy my whole life. Mm -hmm. I have always loved plants. Like there's just something so grounding about nature. And I have this really keen aesthetic eye. I'm a very creative person. So plants give so much outlet for that because they themselves are beautiful and there's endless stuff to learn about them. And filling a home full of plants really just kind of brings you closer to nature. So I am really fascinated in the collecting aspect. And I love just learning every detailed little piece of information about where a plant is from, how it evolved, what it's related to. And yeah, now that I, you know, I'm no longer a child using my mom's windowsills, <laughs> I've just kind of let myself go. And there are plants in every part of my home and it brings me so much joy. I absolutely love it. What's your plant count these days? Ooh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you did move recently, right? So you should know this. Yeah. The last time that I counted, like it was over 400 and oh my gosh. Like I said, like I, I love plants and wow. there's kind of a point that like, you've talked about this on, on your show plenty of times. Like there is a number that works for you mm-hmm. and I think I'm near it. Like okay. I think that there's, yeah, there's kind of a point that I realized earlier this year when I was preparing to move across town that any new plant was going to be at the expense and the detriment of an existing one. Mm-hmm. So I've kind of like leveled off a bit. And I think that this is like the number that I'm comfortable with and able to keep happy. Yeah. That's always an interesting negotiation where you're like, okay, if I'm going to bring in a new plant, that means I have to give away a plant. So is that how badly I want it? Yeah. So we tell ourselves. (laughs) Exactly. My my fiance gets irritated when he comes home and like, there's a new grow light in some unexpected part of the house (laughs) because like I had to get a begonia somewhere. (laughs) Billy can 100% relate to that. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure we could, you know, bond over that. For sure. And when you say here, you're both in Seattle, right? Yes, Mm -hmm. we are. I'm born and raised. Are you really? I'm so jealous. That's like my dream. I would love to move to Seattle. I think it's the most charming, interesting city. And the plant scene, I was shocked at the plant shop scene in Seattle when I was there with cats last year. It was amazing. We have some fantastic Great, yeah. shops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what about you, Stephen? So mine is pretty different. I was very plant blind, I would say, until five or six years ago. I got into aquascaping and that's like planted aquariums. It's a bit of a different scene, I would say, but definitely, you know, plant focused. And then from there, I think Matthew saw an opening, we like to say, he helped me buy this carnivorous plant. I then put it out in a balcony. He kind of gave me the basic care instructions. It did really well. And then from there, just like a a plant success like that, it really grew and grew. And then of course, you know, like seeing Matthew and having that baseline of many, many plants, I then kept uh, acquiring. I joined a local carnivorous plant club, got a bunch of free plants there. And yeah, just got more and more interested in that specific scene. And then it's been um, broadened a lot since uh, we started the show. But yeah, it's kind of a, you know, counterpoint a little bit. Matthew loves tropicals. I've been a lot more into carnivorous plants and succulents. And those have kind of been our angles and the different expertise that we bring. And yeah, we have a lot of different plant opinions that we like to, you know, kind of examine in the show. So 
I love it. And I so appreciate on your show, the different tones of your voices. You never get confused. You know, <laughs> your, your point of views are obviously very obvious too, but yes, very distinct collections, point of views and timbres and tones of voice. It's, it's not hard to, to We didn't even plan you. that. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, great to hear. I mean, I try to act excited, right? When Matthew's excited, but maybe I can't be. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> not always. Something that Steven said that just made me think of something. He was kind of starting to get interested in plants because of their use in aquaria. And I actually really broadened my own interest in plants because of their use in like terraria. So like both of us have this very like specific niche interest. And it's interesting to kind of see where we overlap because there's so many divergent points, but like, it's all very connected. Like there's very few plants that we're not at least mutually respectful towards. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think that's the way it starts for a lot of people. I think people either, you know, get gifted a succulent and Mm -hmm. try a few more succulents and then expand their collection from there. Or Billy, my fiance's entry uh, gateway plant, gateway drug was herbs, you know, and I know a lot of people start with a basil plant or start with, you know, a little herb garden and that encourages them to keep going or they start with some sort of Instagram sexy plant, the yeah. mo- you know, like a monstera yep. or a fiddle leaf if they don't kill it. Cause I feel like so many people get fiddle leaf figs it's and easy. kill them these days and then expand from there. So it is so interesting how you can start so targeted and then kind of slowly let your plant world open from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just with the plants that we talk about on the show and things that our listeners recommend or that other plant podcasters are talking about, like I'm growing so much more stuff now, so much more diverse stuff now than I ever yeah. would mm-hmm. have. Same. It's so cool. And why and when did you guys start the Plant Daddy podcast? So I think we, you know, we were both looking for creative projects to do together. We've been friends for about a decade now. And Aww. we were having, yeah, I was getting into plants. We were having these long plant conversations when we would hang out. Matthew would be we like, We were really oh. alienating our friends. <laughs> yeah. So it, we would disappear for a half hour, talk about new growth on something, right? And then um, we were like, yeah, why don't we like share this? I bet more people would be interested in this. Maybe this is a, that creative project that we could do together. You know, you look at podcasting, it's very easy to start, right? Or you think it is. And then, of course, it's much more work when you try to make something sound great and everything. But Mm -hmm. yeah, getting started was easy. And we're like, oh, let's just record this and put it out and see what happens. And, you know, that's how it Part of the inspiration behind it was just podcasts before we started the show were sort of a foreign medium to me. And I was trying to get more invested in them because so many people were recommending different podcasts. So it was, you know, Pride Month, June 2019. And I just started listening to a bunch of really like queer LGBTQIA plus themed shows. And after listening to a bunch, it was like, this is a format that Steven and I could easily use to talk about this kind of stuff to an audience that actually wants to hear it. Because a lot of our own growth as plant parents has been from having conversations with experienced plant people. Like when we Mm -hmm. both got the Stefania erecta, that plant does not have a lot of information available for growing it online. And so, you know, we had to reach out to other people who were growing it. We looked at the hashtags on Instagram. We reached out to people with great looking plants. Like the plant community is so interested in passing on this knowledge that each of us have gained and everyone's experience with growing plants and their individual conditions and regions is so varied that we saw just that there was this, this really great opportunity to have it be more than like, Stephen and Matthew chatting about plants at a dinner party when no one else wants to hear. We thought we could take that instead to a podcast so that maybe if anybody out there wanted to hear about what we have found with some of these plants, it might be something interesting to uh, you know put out into the world. And it's been amazing, the response and the community. It's been really fun. It's been great. That's awesome. I can so relate to your normal friends just having no interest. For me, it was talking about my tomato plant <laughs> and the, my first tomato flower and the smell of tomato leaves. And my girlfriends oh, were yeah. like, just shut up. <laughs> I <laughs> love the smell of tomato foliage in the warm it's summer amazing. sun. Oh, it's beautiful. Bottle that. It's Make magical. It a, yeah, put it in a candle. Yeah, and watching your first tomato flower turn into a tomato. Yeah. There's no no better experience than that, truly. Yeah, I, I think that maybe the slightly better experience is then eating that tomato. Of course. Yeah, like of course. a little bit of salt, maybe some mayo on a piece of sourdough. It's perfect. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Or a little, I'm Italian, so maybe a little olive oil, a little basil. I won't say no to that. My mom would serve. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, I'm so excited to do a little deep dive with you guys. And when I listen to your show, I'm like, oh, I'm so jealous. They get to just like do this all the time together and do your little nerdy deep dives. I think something in our community that comes up a lot is humidity and winter. So we're in, we're doing this recording in December. I believe it's airing in January. We're deep into winter now. I mm-hmm. think some people too, we have a lot of new plant parents this year mm-hmm. in 2020, 2021. So this is going to be a lot of people's first winter. It might be for surprises. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I think that there's nothing like that first year of plant parenthood, enjoying all of those seasons for the first time, especially your first spring after your first winter and like watching all your plants wake up again. Yeah. So I felt like we could just, you know, jam a little bit on, on winter, winterizing plants, what to expect, how to troubleshoot. Cause I know Mm -hmm. personally over the last three years, I've definitely learned from experience some things not to do. Mm I guess let's start with what's actually happening in winter that is affecting our plants. Well, this is going to vary a lot based on what plants you're growing and where you're growing them. The problem, Mm -hmm. well, it's not a problem. It's a reality. The situation that Stephen and I face in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm sure this is true for everyone in these northern latitudes, Mm -hmm. is that your sunlight diminishes greatly. The sun is really low on the horizon and it doesn't stay up for terribly long. So the mm-hmm. very biggest thing to me is just light levels are greatly diminished. Yeah. And then I think from there, right, the light patterns in your home can change. So maybe, you know, you have this plant in the same window, it's getting less light, but maybe the light's behind a building now, right? Um, so that's something mm-hmm. to just pay attention to. Example out of my own home where I have a sitting room that has west and south facing windows. I'm growing, well, I was growing like a plumeria and cacti and other succulents and these like full sun, bright light plants. And I found that sometime about a month ago, the sun is now low enough that it is mostly behind the house next door to us. So Mm -hmm. I've had to shuffle things around because that was a perfect location for these plants three months ago when I moved here. But Mm -hmm. Now that window is basically like a north exposure or maybe a sheltered east. Like it's very, very different. And that's such a good point to not only depending on where in the northern hemisphere or for some of our listeners, southern or wherever else in the world we all live, but your individual lighting setup is so different than everyone else's because of not only the way your house is positioned, but the other houses and apartment complex and buildings around you, Yeah, Mm -hmm. right? Because you have those beautiful Southern Western facing windows, but because your house next to you is blocking that light. And I know for a lot of urban dwellers, the apartment building in front or behind you is blocking that light that just because you have, oh, this is a Southern window equals fiddle leaf fig and cacti Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that. Yeah. And so everyone needs to become kind of a super sleuth within their own home in figuring out like the basics of like, where do my windows face? What kind of plants do I have in them? But then also like the surroundings and the kind of secondary and tertiary things that affect that as well. Yeah. Cause maybe, you know, we used to go to work, maybe this applies less now, but you know, you would be at work during the day. You may not see the sun pattern even just assuming it. I had this with a, it was a pilea peperomioides, that Chinese money plant. I, you know, went back to water it and it just was so wet I'm like, okay, why is this so wet? I'm, you know, I, this is the same watering schedule I had. I thought it was getting sun during the day. I was home during the day and, you know, it was being blocked by like some chair now that I had in my balcony. Yeah. And that's kind of a second piece here is that your, your plants will tend to drink less water. Maybe they are, you know, slowing their growth. It is something you should pay attention to. You may need to change that watering schedule. Right. Because there's less light availability. Therefore, if plants eat light, they're not working as hard, you know, because Mm -hmm. they're just not available. There's not enough light available to them. And I think that's one of the, we'll talk about this later, but like one of the biggest things that everybody has to be careful of is noticing that soil that normally dries out within a week Mm -hmm. might dry out within two weeks in the winter. And that's where you have to start pairing back watering for sure. Yeah, I think that the next component is how cold does your area get and what kind of heating are you using? Because Mm -hmm. again, Pacific Northwest, like 
I think that this is maybe something that most of the country doesn't realize, but you know, like hardiness zones, they're kind of like a band throughout the country. And we have a basically equivalent climate in terms of like winter lows to a lot of parts of the South and like Texas. So we have fairly warm winters, so we don't have to do a lot in terms of indoor heating. But if you live somewhere that's much more cold where you have to be heating with either like radiators or like forced air, or I'm actually using a gas fireplace right now. And I I'm trying to figure out what that's going to do to my indoor conditions. Mm -hmm. Like interesting. Yeah. Styles of heating are really, going to affect it. I think that if you have these plants that think that it's winter, but you've continued their active growing temperatures, you can run into some problems with a cactus in a now dim window without enough light, but it's still consistently above 70 degrees. It's going to still be trying to grow and it's just not going to be as happy. And it's going to look kind of sad when it comes to springtime. I'm going through that radiator issue right now. I moved into this house in the summer. Mm -hmm. I've got beautiful Eastern facing windows, my little plants and peperomia and Hoya and succulents. Some of my higher light plants have Mm -hmm. been like doubling in growth. And then this in the last couple of weeks, as it's gotten cold in New York, I've heard the radiators kicked on, Mm -hmm. but I didn't even really notice that one of the radiators is literally under the windowsill. And as I was watering one of the, uh, as I was watering those plants, I was like, oh my God, these plants are bone dry. I watered these things four days ago. Normally they're still like rather damp four, four days in. And the radiator is throwing off so much dry heat that it's it's like sucking the water out of the pots Mm -hmm. so much faster, interestingly enough. Yeah, that's a big wrinkle here, right? So I think generally my approach would be to water less. It's probably going to be drinking less. But yeah, if you have a situation like that, a radiator, you know, that's so hot in that same window where you want to keep them near the light. Yeah, maybe just pay attention, right? So either water more or water less. The conventional wisdom is to water less, let your plants dry more of the winter. But if you're not paying close attention to the actual soil moisture levels, like sticking your finger in there and actually figuring Mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. I know that I have been guilty of this. I have let plants over the winter get like almost catastrophically dry just because I'm like, oh yeah, it's winter. I don't need to water them as regularly, but same situation, not a radiator, but like a forced air vent right underneath a windowsill has really like dried out some plants and also the atmospheric humidity. So then you're increasing your risk of like all kinds of pest issues. Like it can be a real issue. So new plant parents, the biggest tip I can give is very closely pay attention to the moisture of your soil. Yeah. And remember what Mm -hmm. it was like when your plant was thriving in the summertime, right? It shouldn't be wildly different, maybe a bit on the drier side, I would say, but yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. And I think there are little humidity hacks that we can talk about in a little bit that that help offset that. I've also just ordered some moisture meters and some hygrometers, thermometers. Oh, yeah. they, they measure the humidity and I'm really excited to experiment with that this winter. I have those in all my rooms. I love them. <laughs> Yeah. When I was back in my opera singing days and I would go have auditions, our hack that we would do is if we had a radiator, Mm -hmm. because we wouldn't want to get dry before we had to sing, we Uh would put a damp rag on top of the radiator. Mm -hmm. And as the radiator emitted heat, the water would evaporate out of the rag and it would make the room really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, maybe a fire hazard. Maybe people. I was going to say, should, isn't that like yeah. don't keep your socks on the radiator or something like that? But yeah, I mean, like maybe don't do it. that. <laughs> Just make sure maybe that. Don't do that. Don't. <laughs> but, don't like leave do it, it there and then leave your home. That actually yeah. reminds me, though, of a tip that I read in the very first like orchid care book that I got. And it was saying, like, during the winter when humidity is low and you're using indoor heat, put a gravel tray on top of the radiator and then Mm -hmm. arrange your orchids on top of that. Oh, a gravel tray. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, That would be for, you know, fireproof, I guess. When I leave for a few weeks, I'll Mm -hmm. put all my plants together on my coffee table in bright and direct light. Mm -hmm. I put them all together and I stress about it for two weeks and I don't do anything. I mean, I give them a good water and sometimes my neighbor will come and water them like in the halfway mark and I come back and I'm like so stressed. They're going to be so dead. And they... The peperomia have all thrown off inflorescence, the geranium. That's right. Like they're so happy and it makes me so sad. Well, I'm I'm happy for them, but I'm kind of disappointed that they didn't need me for it. Yeah, we've all felt that, right? That that benign neglect, you know, that we're like, oh, I mean, 
Yeah. But my kind of hypothesis is because they're all grouped together, there must be like a little microclimate that happens within them that helps them retain moisture and also kind of just stay happy, I guess. Yeah. Matthew and I both do this, but I think we would both say that that's a more impactful thing you can do for humidity, right? Yeah. Group your plants and yeah. There is a risk there. If you have grouped your plants really closely and if one of them gets pests, yep. they're all going to get pests. They're all going to get pests. Yeah. So this totally. is a lot of people have feelings on like whether your plant should be touching. I personally would rather just monitor for pests and then treat for pests with much more regularity than to just yeah. have like one individual fern, like three feet away from another individual fern. Oh, so, we've never discussed this, Matthew. Okay. I would oh. never have mine touch. I, all right. So I just went to like, when I was <sighs> setting this, uh, setting up this table for this interview, I was like, oh gosh, like this refitifor tetrasterma is touching this other orchid. It's not like three feet away, but it, there's always, there's like little tuckings happening or like I'll put yeah. it behind the, Okay. Uh, Well, we're learning about each other on this. Fun fact, in one of the recent classes I took called The Science of Tree Communication, Mm -hmm. you learn that if you look aerial on a forest, there's a small break between every tree. Yeah. And they do it through VOCs, like they communicate with each other and they will not overreach each other. Yeah. I've seen some amazing videos of these trees like breathing and blowing in the wind. It's it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Trees are the coolest. But anyway, back to winter. (laughs) So that's interesting. We'll do some more humidity talk in a little bit, but dormancy. So I think what a lot of people don't know is houseplants will go dormant. Plants go dormant. They like go to sleep a little bit Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. they'll wake up. But some plants do and some plants don't. And I think people stress about dormancy. A few We've gotten a few listener questions yeah. about dormancy and what plants go dormant and what don't and what do I have to look for and is my plant going to die? And I personally think back to like my first year of plant parenthood. I got a caladium. I didn't mm-hmm. know it was a caladium. I just got it because I thought the leaves were really pretty. Yeah. And I bought it like late in the summer. And in the early fall, all the leaves fell and I thought I killed it and I threw it away. But in thinking now, I'm like, oops, like that you could have recovered it. <laughs> went dormant <laughs> yeah. and I thought it died. Yeah. Um, so I cut off all the leaves and I, you know, and I composted it. So what have you guys learned about dormancy and, and what do you feel like people should know about dormancy and houseplants? I think that people shouldn't be like intimidated about it. It's like mm-hmm. everything has a cycle. You look outside and in most climates, in most places, like there are seasonal changes. Yeah. I love that perspective. Yeah. Like I try to just remind myself when something happens in the fall or winter, that's not ideal for a plant that it's not ideal for me looking at the plant. It's, it's that aesthetic thing that's lost, but the plant itself is still fine. So for instance, like I have this gorgeous alocasia amazonica. It's one of my prized plants. I'm growing it in like this special kind of like layered planting technique that we talk about a lot on our show. And Mm -hmm. it was a really lush full plant. And then about a month ago, it just started yellowing. It just started dropping leaves. And I've never had that issue with this plant before, even though that's a common struggle with alocasia. It's just time for it to go to sleep. And so I pruned off the leaves and now I'm letting it dry a bit. And once the soil itself is more dry, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to replant it in fresh substrate with a fresh setup and kind of harnessing this moment as like, it's not actively growing. I'm not going to make it stressed by, you know, something catastrophic to the roots if I move it. So I just think of these like seasonal cycles as kind of like informing what to do with your plants when sometimes. A lot Mm -hmm. of plants that we grow indoors are not true tropicals. They might be more subtropical, like, you know, plants that you'll see growing outdoors in the Sun Belt or, you know, Southern California. Those aren't really tropical because that's not tropical conditions. So these are plants that are actually going to have some of that seasonal slowing uh, more so than you know, the true tropicals from rainforests, those plants don't have marked seasons necessarily in the same way all the time. So there's a lot of flexibility kind of in what a plant is going to tolerate indoors versus like how it's going to want to grow in nature. So I would just encourage people to not overthink it. We really love to get into the weeds in our show, right? Like into the details. But I do think it always helps to know, you know, the genus of your plant, what type of plant it is. And you can go online and look and understand exactly what this dormancy behavior might be like. 
right? I mean, for some plants, it's really dramatic. I have some carnivorous plants that will shed all their leaves and turn into like a little, you know, nub just in the soil um, that's very green, but, you know, it's not really going to wake up until the weather's warm again. But, you know, I would say at this point in my plant journey, I think I appreciate that, you know, some plants are the star of the show. Uh, in summer, you know, many are, but there are winter growing plants as well. Um, and some cool dormancy forms even, you know, where they, it's like dying back to some little, little nub and then coming back and then there might be babies later, you know, like little offshoots. So I think it's an exciting time in its own way that I definitely didn't appreciate at first either. So no blame, but you know, a couple years in now, I do appreciate. And I love that you mentioned Caladium in particular, because they're so beautiful. They're such like an attractive plant when you see them at stores, but it's a deciduous dormancy. Like plants that are actually deciduous during their dormancy can really stress out plant parents who just want a beautiful plant all year round. But Stephen and I both grow a few plants that just look like lumpy potatoes in the winter or that are just a pot of soil or bare naked branches. So you might also want to do a little bit of research when you pick your plant, because if you want something that's always going to be presentable, you don't want a caladium. Then a Stefania erecta is not the exactly. Point for you. Yeah, exactly. like mine right now is like just a little rock in a pot. Yeah, Full that potato. Could be yep. A potato. Yep. Full potato. Yeah, I think too for people who stress out about dormancy, I feel like I sound like a broken record on on this show, but dormancy seasons they teach us so many things. If you can reframe it in your mind, instead of being like, oh man, my plants are about to go dormant or my plants going dormant. What did I do? This is so stressful, but celebrate it instead of stress about it, celebrate it, celebrate that your plant is doing this thing that it intuitively knows how to do shedding what it doesn't need to shed and then preparing for an even bigger bloom. You know, that potato that you're, that you just showed me is preparing for an even larger, more exciting bloom in the spring. That's going to bring you so much joy and kind of see those parallels within yourself. And I don't know, I look at 2020, there was a lot of dormancy in 2020 for so many of us. (laughs) We're all going to bloom so nicely. Perfect metaphor for that. Yeah. So hard in 2021. And you know, I would even say to you in, in many, cases, you can kind of give yourself a pat in the back because you have provided the plant the conditions that it understands where it can act naturally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like you're saying, it's going to come back better um, next season. And, you know, I love that there are plenty of plants that you can, to some extent, just grow indefinitely without dormancy. If you make their conditions match what they need to be constantly renewing their growth instead of just maintaining. But you might not get blooms on them. Like there are so many orchids that need like cool dry rest periods. There are so many, you know, cactuses, a lot of cactuses like your Christmas and Thanksgiving cactus won't bloom if you haven't given it a bit of a dormancy. And so totally, I think of it more as a rest period for a lot of plants. Yeah. It's just taking a little nap. Yeah. It's it's time to renew. Yeah, let's just go in for a spa day and it's a little pot and it's going to come back later. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have so we many have... friends who just have like trays of dormant plants like tucked away for the winter. Like, yeah, it's relaxing. Them in. Yeah. They're relaxing. They've had a hard season. You bring up an interesting point, which I think we should also touch on. So seasons happening because the light changes and the, the weather changes and indoors our indoor environments are not necessarily fully replicating what's happening outdoors. If our plants are close to windows, yes, they're experiencing less light availability. They're experiencing the weather changes in our apartment or, you know, drafts or whatever. But a lot of us grow plants under grow lights away from windows. And so plants might not necessarily get triggered to go dormant in those areas. And I know some people specifically do that, like, because they want blooms year round. I feel like people, there are different schools of thought on this. Like some people put their plants under grow lights and feed them all year round and, and trick their plants not to go dormant in order to enjoy those blooms. I kind of am reconciling that because I also have plants under grow lights, but then part of me is also like, but I kind of want the plant to go through the seasons that it's supposed to go through. But I think that's also something to understand that if you're listening to our conversation, but all of your plants are under grow lights, it's not necessarily going to happen. The plant isn't going to know it's January, you know, unless it's going through whatever those, you know, whatever those seasonal changes are. (laughs) But I'm going to say, sometimes I have a plant that just goes dormant and I'm like, 
how did you know what time of year well, it was? I've given you no insight into what is happening in the yeah, world. Yeah. And I feel like we are kind of stepping off the complexity deep end a little bit when we talk about that, right? But it's like, I do have plants that will not need a light change, but if there is an ambient temperature change, right, just in totally. my house, it will read that cue. Uh, it's these pinguicula carnivorous plants in particular. Sometimes they'll just go dormant, like from temperature alone. So yeah, there's a lot of factors. Orchids too, right? Orchids need that cold shock as well, right? Quite a lot of them do appreciate having a cool, dry period to initiate flowering. Like a lot of the mm-hmm. Catlia, the really beautiful ones from South America, a lot mm-hmm. of them have that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting. And we we don't have to dive deeper as, you know, we're all like speculating any right, yeah. from our yeah. research. But it also just goes to show like, you know, these are all things that everyone everybody can be thinking about, but take everything we're saying with a grain of salt because your setup and your home and your plants exactly. are all going to be acting yeah. in their own ways. One other thing on dormancy, have you guys noticed because I don't pay close enough attention to this and you guys pay attention to the details? bulbs like are there types of plants that as a rule of thumb go dormant that people know i mean obviously orchids obviously do Mm -hmm. bulbs like caladiums that are all like those bulb based i think oxalis do because i got an oxalis this summer so i guess this is going to be my first winter with it going dormant but yeah what are any other rule of thumbs with dormancy well not to get like too in the weeds about this but Uh this is partially why i like fully understanding like where a plant comes from geographically and also ecologically because Mm -hmm. the plants that grow continuously year round, they're often jungle plants. They are often plants that grow lower in the jungle where they're more insulated Mm -hmm. so that their conditions are very consistent year round. And the ones that need a bit of uh, time to recover and rejuvenate, they're more often from climates or ecosystems that have these seasonal changes. So the orchids that we were just talking about, even though they're from the jungles of Brazil, they are high up in the trees. Some of these trees may shed their leaves. The monsoon season is over. So they're going to get cooler, drier conditions with bright light for a period of the year. And without that, then they're not going to flower. A kind of similar uh, comparison is then if you have plants that grow in like deserts or something, they might be very, very hot. They might be very dry during the summer. And then during the winter, they're cool enough that the plant stops growing. They still get the same light mm-hmm. conditions, but they have different temperatures. Like it's it's more of this temperate subtropical kind of stuff. And I was going to say like, as far as, you know, kind of bite-sized advice for this a little bit, I do know for succulents, there are some very helpful charts that you can find that tell if your succulent plant is a summer grower or a winter grower. So it can give you some indication of like, oh, if it's this species, when the, you know, when it's summertime conditions, like hotter and longer days, it's going to stop growing. It's going to be, you know, dor- you know, be more dormant. And then, you know, others in winter, they'll start their growth. So I think, you know, you can find some indications that way. I mean, Matthew would definitely know more about like plants with bulbs and, and that sort of scene than me. But as far as succulents go. Yeah, the cool thing about bulbs is that a lot of them, like the actual formation of a bulb, which is like thick modified leaves that are right at the stem level, it stores all those carbohydrates and nutrients for the plant to do its thing. I'm always shocked at how daffodils and tulips just like throw up flowers and Mm -hmm. leaves. And then by the time summer's at full tilt, all that foliage is gone and the plant is Yeah, they're out of here already. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Such an appreciation a moment. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Or just you go to the grocery store. There's like this dark box full of these things. I'm in like disbelief each time. I'm like, is that alive? Like, really? Yeah. Like, will that do anything? But you have bulbs from very cold climates because like they are designed to like shoot up and grow as soon as spring happens. And then they die back when it's, you know, summer and everything. But then you also have tropical ones. I'm currently growing. It's an amaryllis. Uh, it's actually in the hippiastrum family uh, or genus, but it is an epiphytic and mostly evergreen hippiastrum. It is so it's like, you know, epiphytic, right? That's like growing in the trees kind of thing, right? Yeah. Not, not in, yeah. in soil. But- but it's like a bulb that will grow on branches rooting into moss and it maintains its foliage most of the year. You have not told me about this and I feel <laughs> left out. Okay, so we can sync up after the show. Yeah. I want to see that. <laughs> okay, this this is going to be a conflict when we're done recording with you. Yeah, we but- should move on. Mm. 
but it devised like some of that conventional wisdom about bulbs. Some bulbs are going to actually grow year round just fine, but they're like, they're the weird tropical ones. They're kind of the outliers. But just like Stephen was saying, lots of them are going to grow in the winter, like the South African succulents and bulbs. Oftentimes they're going to just peace out during the hot, sunny part of the year and then become active when it's cooler and a little bit wetter. Totally. Another thing that I like to recommend to people who miss blooms in the winter Mm -hmm. is forcing bulbs. I think that's what it's called, but grow amaryllis, man. Mm -hmm. Um, Paper whites. I freaking love paper whites. I love how quickly they grow. You can buy those kits around the, uh, around the holidays. They're always on sale in January. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you set them up. Basically you put them in the bottom of a pot and add some water, like with some rocks at the bottom of it and the, how quickly it grows and watching that bloom happen, especially in the new year when you've got all these new, you know, exciting feelings. Yeah. I love the fragrance too. And like, I like to tell this, I like to tell this story, but I like kind of my plant blind days. I remember walking around Ikea, seeing like some plastic amaryllis and being like, Oh, what an interesting sort of interpretation of this alien plant that's just a prop Mm -hmm. like i did not think that that was a real thing okay it was truly plant blind right like five or something years ago and then you know matthew having them and i'm like what i'm like wait this is just (laughs) gonna come out of this ball yeah so more appreciation we've all had those moments okay so let's just kind of go over so what are the things the secret plant killers in the winter time that everybody needs to look out for let me recap what we've already talked about radiators i think are the biggest thing Mm -hmm. understanding there's going to be less light availability therefore if you continue watering your plants the same way you water in the summer Mm -hmm. that's an easy way to get root rot what else did we say so the air is likely going to be more dry than in the summer there's going to be less humidity in the air as well as less light what are the other secret things that people should look out for that you might not necessarily know intuitively? I would say, you know, it's a it's a stressful time for plants because it's change, right? Maybe you're bringing some indoors or like you're saying, radiators turning on. So just uh, be careful and watch out for pests. Yeah, yes. I would say that my biggest winter struggle is monitoring for pests because I grow a lot of plants that appreciate kind of the typical like 50 to 60% humidity that I have in my home, like winters Mm -hmm. in Seattle are actually quite wet. So this is the most humid time of our year, but indoors when you're heating the calatheas get spider mites, like the palms get spider mites. So this is when I really, really double down on my pest management because everything is a little bit stressed. They would be stressed if they were in the wild too. Like it's just kind of a time of year that plants are, you know, not at their most optimal health. And that's when you need to make sure that you're not unnecessarily disturbing them if they don't want it, that you're not just letting some problem like pests overwhelm them. It's it's that mindfulness that I think is really key over the winter months, because if your plant looks really ugly, and if you're kind of, you know, getting some of that seasonal defective disorder, Seasonal affective? Affective. Affective disorder. (laughs) Sad. Yeah. Seasonal affective disorder. Yeah. So when you're like sad over the winter, you can easily stop paying attention to some of your plants that aren't putting out new leaves to get your attention or blooming to get Mm -hmm. your attention. Yeah. So that to me is like the most key element. And what does that look like for you? You're doubling down. The pest control management part. Mm Mm-hmm. I would say it's just checking plants more, right? I, for me, there's a big like move from outdoors to indoors. I'd grow a lot of things on my balcony, then I bring them back in. So it's really just checking them. So I'll water, I will check in the nooks and crannies, right? I'll look for signs of stress like, oh, is this a strange kind of yellowing of these leaves that I don't see or, you know, typically that wouldn't just be like an old leaf dying. Um, maybe they're dying more quickly. You know, you can look for shiny parts on leaves that that could be honeydew that scale is emitting. So, you know, it's a lot of these just different little signs, little, you know, cobweb looking things that could be spider mites. So it's, I guess it's really just checking. Checking under those leaves, baby. That's yeah. where everybody likes ah, to hide. Yes. Check under those leaves. And there are plenty of plants that have like tight little like pendules. Mycoia compacta, and yeah. 
Yeah, actually, I was that's like, a poster child plant for this. Yeah, yeah. I just call that like a mealy bug hotel. I actually yeah. do have one. This might shock some of our listeners who have heard me complain about this plant and its pest potential, but I have one, mm-hmm. and I surprisingly really like it. And I found my first mealy bug on it the other day, oh, so I went. No. Yeah, but I think it's fine. Like I took the plant, and I do this anytime that I notice a pest infestation. But like winter is when this happens the most. I think I take the whole plant to the shower or the sink. And in both of my showers, I actually got the kind of faucet that has like a hose attached with a little spray. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. then this way I can just, you know, spray hard jets of water on the plant. I usually use something that's fairly chilly, like insects are all cold blooded. So if you're spraying it with warm water, they might not be quite as um, deterred, but if you're blasting off mealybugs or you know spider mice with cold water, they're going to kind of seize up because it just is suddenly a shocking cold. So you can get a lot of them off that way. I also have really fine, very soft bristled paintbrushes that I'll just like dip in alcohol and then like wipe through all the leaves. Yeah. 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 And this is just something that I plan to spend time every week doing just checking things and then spraying manually removing them. And then I'll follow up with an insecticidal soap spray. I really like products that contain the chemical spinosad because it's good against Mm -hmm. thrip. It's maybe not the best in my experience against scale or mealybugs, but it's, it's been my favorite pest control chemical. Yeah. And that's kind yeah. of like the whole arsenal I think Matthew's talking about. But, you know, once you've done your transition to winter, hopefully you don't have to do this all the time, right? Like he's saying, yeah. like he has a large collection, but... Right. 400 plants also is, is asking for a yeah, pest outbreak. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like I, <laughs> I, what, I am asking yeah, for don't, this. I don't want to scare people. percentage of available uh, real estate for, for pests to come set up camp, for sure. Mm-hmm. And they're all <laughs> holding hands. It's like one giant chain of plants touching. <laughs> right. They're just <laughs> dancing all together. I just learned and it's stressing me out. Yeah, we were going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. One other thing that, I don't know, maybe this doesn't affect other people. Anytime that I have plants die of drought, it is either in the hottest weeks of summer where I'm forgetting to water as often as I need to to replenish, or it's over winter. Like I kind of alluded to that before, but I lose plants to underwatering because in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, I watered that in 3 a.m. two weeks ago. It's going to be fine for another few days. But because it's heated, because like the indoor conditions are still warm, I might actually need to be watering more frequently. So not to like totally belabor that point, but just because you think the plant needs less water, which it does, you might still need to be watering as regularly or sometimes even more regularly than you were in peak season. It's very important to actually assess the soil conditions. So, you know, we're saying water less and more. Okay. Yeah. It, water it depends less. on your home. Water more. <laughs> yeah. Use a humidity tray. We Don't try to be helpful. Yeah. You do you guys. <laughs> well, what what I love about houseplants in general is that there is not like one answer to everything. Everything has to be yeah. kind of tailored to your own home and conditions. I personally love using an actual humidifier just because that way I can set it running. I know that it's going to boost the humidity like five to 10% like throughout the day. And mm-hmm. that's kind of my safeguard to make sure that I don't fall below kind of 40%. 40% is kind of the point where I'm like, eh, okay, I need to start increasing. I need to start doing mm-hmm. something for the majority of my tropical foliage plants. Did you know that it's already time to start planning this year's garden? Can you believe we're here again? If you are looking for seeds or plants for your gardens this year, look no further than Territorial Seed Company. I am beyond excited to have Territorial Seed as our seed provider for our garden this year in our new home. We've got big gardening plans. The sheer variety of plants that Territorial Seed Company has available on their website and in their catalog is so impressive. It's insane. Whatever you're interested in growing, they likely have it in either seed or plant options. I was skimming their tomato selection with Billy last night as we're starting to figure out what we want to grow, and their tomato section is just mind-blowing. Cherry tomatoes are Billy's favorite food. I'm so excited to grow millions of them for him. 
Territorial Seed Company is an independent, family-owned business. They've been in operation since 1979, and I love that they really see themselves as farmers and gardeners, so they keep us, their clients, in mind because they see themselves as us. And to ensure that all of the seeds and plants that they sell continue to be of the highest quality because they do extensive testing on their products at their 75-acre certified organic research farm. So the cool thing is these trials are conducted under their short season, high elevation, and low input conditions in Oregon. And because of that, the varieties that thrive in this environment are more likely to flourish just about anywhere. So their plants are rather hardy. And because of that amazing farm, Territorial is actually its own largest seed supplier, producing 25% of the seeds on site. So in terms of knowing where your food comes from, when you order from them, you like literally know exactly where it comes from, this farm in Oregon. In addition to that, they use no chemical fertilizers or pest controls. They produce compost on site using their 35-foot worm composter. They source all their soil amendments from within the community and follow regenerative agricultural practices. They're awesome. Check out their variety and their catalog by going to territorialseed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off your order. Once again, that's code BLOOM10 for 10% off your order at territorialseed.com. Okay, have you taken the Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test yet? What are you waiting for, plant friend? It's a short and super fun free quiz that I made for our community to get a list of recommended plants, DIY projects, and Bloom and Grow Radio podcasts specifically curated for you by me. So here's the deal. One of the biggest questions that I always get is what's the perfect starter plant? But I have to be honest with you, I don't think there's an answer to that question. There's no blanket starter plant for everyone. Everyone talks about succulents being so hard to kill. Well, I actually feel that succulents are extremely easy to kill for anyone who likes to water their plants frequently or doesn't have bright light. They would kill a succulent immediately. But a fern could be a great starter plant for that person, where a succulent could be a great starter plant for someone who travels a lot or is a forgetful plant parent that maybe doesn't water their plants all the time. So I tried to take the guesswork out of it for you, and I made this super cute little quiz. I hope you take it and I hope you learn something new about yourself from the materials and that they help you keep blooming and keep growing. So to take the test, go to bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality, take the quiz and let me know your results on Instagram. I cannot wait to see them. Humidity, the big topic of winterizing plants and also house plants in general, but this is something that a lot of people start to think about in the winter when our radiators kick on, our forced air happens, and all of a sudden the humidity in our house drops and we all always wake up in the morning like gasping for air with, yeah. you know, sore throats every day. <laughs> so humid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So adding humidity can be great for our bodies as well as our plants. Mm-hmm. So before we dive into some humidity hacks and best practices, let's just understand the humidity levels that our plants enjoy outdoors. So in the jungle where our tropical plants are, like what are those humidity levels around? So I was reading this. I found a figure that said um, 88% for the Amazon. Okay. And yeah, that is very different. You know, like I think we all know home environments are so different and in nature, it's kind of an extreme environment, the human home, right? Like yes. it is very dark. It is kind of dry. So, you know, bringing your plant in from its like 180 degree skylight with tons of, you know, humidity sources and everything into our house, it is kind of a big ask of them. So I've been in uh, like the Andes Mountains of Peru, where they have these cloud forests, where these tropical jungle mountains are literally just in the cloud bank. So yeah. just standing there, you just get wet. Your, yeah. your hair just gets wet. And at every breath you take, like there's moisture, like collecting well, on my mustache, but you know, not everyone has a mustache. And so the the orchids, like there were so many of these little like cloud forest orchids growing there. These are plants that I will never ever grow in my home. I have killed many of them. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, like if you're talking plants from Mexico, like the Monstera or Anthurium clarinervium, they actually might have like seasonal humidity that goes down to like the lowest 60s, I think I was seeing kind of, I was looking at this website that gave like, 
rainfall and temperature and humidity like by year like mm-hmm. throughout the 12 months so it does vary considerably and i think that a lot of the plants that we grow are kind of fine to live in this like 40 to 60% range that's kind of my target which for you know all the plants that i've grown the vast majority of them are quite fine in that range and steve even grows some plants that i would traditionally think like wow that needs more humidity but then I see what his hygrometer reads and it's like, oh, well, I guess I'm wrong. It's embarrassing. Yeah. So for a lot of my <laughs> plants, I try I don't try to keep it dry. But, you know, if you have drier, you know, a drier home humidity wise, then your terracotta pots, I feel like they do dry out faster. And, you know, if you need your cacti and succulents to dry out quickly, um, that is easier than if you have 70% humidity. Right. Yeah. So it's all kind totally. of part of that conditions equation that we think about all the time. Yeah. Our plants are not designed to live in our indoor environments. And I think part of us as plant parents needs to understand the responsibility of trying to best replicate to the best of our abilities, the outdoor environment for our plants. But at Mm. the same time, I think there's part of us that also just needs to set it free that we are ever going to recreate the Amazon rainforest in our homes. I think that's true. And realistically... We can't keep our homes at 80% humidity. The paint would peel off of our walls. And then the drywall. Just ask Matthew. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Everything would rot. (laughs) I I actually, um, like two apartments ago, I had a second bedroom that I just kind of turned into my plant room. And it was a carpeted space. And And spoiler alert, he did not get the deposit back. Okay. Oh, boy. Uh, Yeah. Like there, there were other issues in this building that were completely independent for me. Like the roof was rotting. So whatever. Yeah. But, you know, the mildew was insane. Like you open the door and you're just stepping into a greenhouse, but it's a carpeted bedroom. And yeah. my plants freaking loved it. But on the other hand, like I moved a bookcase when we moved and the back of the wall was just gray and black mildew. So totally. it is really not what you should be doing in your home. If you're growing something that actually requires that, like, I hope mm-hmm. you have a greenhouse or even an Ikea, you know, grow cabinet. Yeah. The new Ikea cabinet it, that everyone and their mom is setting oh up. Exactly. Like the new thing. It is blowing my mind. <laughs> yeah. And our friend Jane Perone from On the Ledge, I know you know her too, Maria yes. Well. She just did an episode um, interviewing people about that. Yeah. I would kind of point you there if you are really, really worried about humidity or you have such a, you know, demanding plant that you need to set up that 80% or something. Yes. I recently had Doug Chamberlain on the show. Yes. um, A Hoya expert. It was an amazing, amazing episode. I love that one. He is a hardcore Hoya lover Mm -hmm. and he has a room that has green, like basically greenhouse conditions set up to set his Hoyas up for success. And he takes that next step. Mm -hmm. But I think 30 to 60%, at least I, I'm playing with hygrometers and I've got a couple of different yeah. types that I'm experimenting with. And one of the manuals says zero to 30 frowny face, 30 mm. to 60 happy face, yeah. 60 a plus frowny face again. So <laughs> I feel like with us, you know, shooting for 30 to 60, where do you guys like to hover? Because I know you guys have been measuring your humidity for a long time. So where do yeah. you guys like to hover um, in your own home? And I think we have different approaches here, but I think they're both good actually. So for my house, I mean, often it's 30%. And I see this because I have these, um, you know, monitors on tables, and it's monitoring temperature and also humidity. And I'm really kind of I was most interested in temperature actually for those, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I would say it's mostly 30. And then for me, I do have some plants that require a lot and I kind of have separate chambers set up for them. So it's a little bit like that Ikea cabinet. Um, And then in there, yeah, these are, you know, kind of the two examples I have, I have bell jars for some, and then Mm -hmm. I have like a kind of a fish tank that um, I have lights on and it's mostly covered and that's for helium fora, this um, South American carnivorous plant that likes humidity a lot. And then there I can maintain closer to 80, right? But then you don't have the mold issues that you're talking about. I think Matthew tries to do a lot more in open air. I mean, I use like the same strategies we were talking about previously, right? Like, you know, groups of plants and uh, trays here and there. But I think Matthew goes a step, a couple steps further with uh, humidifiers and things like that, right? Yeah. And just something to 
point out, Stephen's plants are on average dramatically smaller than mine. He grows a lot of things in like two yeah, to four inch right. pots, whereas mm-hmm. I'm growing a lot of things in like six to 12 inch pots. So for me, it's not really yeah. as reasonable to use bell jars. However, the one plant that I do grow like covered in a cloche under lights is one of these helium fora because they come from these like high plateaus in Venezuela where they're always bathed in mist. So it's right. very unrealistic to expect to grow this as a standard house plant, but it's a small compact plant that does well in this enclosed space. The only other plants that I do in partially enclosed or enclosed conditions are like jewel orchids or something. But for the majority of my plants, I grow a lot of ficus, I grow a lot of orchids, I grow a lot of aeroids, calathea, like the Marantaceae. Like I've said, like I kind of aim for like 50 to 60% humidity. Mm-hmm. If we have a particularly hot period of the year, I'll like run my dehumidifier on its maximum level uh, in order to kind of boost it maybe up to like 75 to 80 for short periods. Just Your humidifier, because, you mean, right? Yes. Answer to raise it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because I want to make sure that in the hot periods of summer where some plants might be like reaching a point of stress, that the humidity is increased to help them through that. Because the warmer your conditions, the more the plant is transpiring, the more moisture is being lost. You might not want to be increasing your watering and risking root health. Mm-hmm. So that's a good way to kind of get through it. But for the most part, like I am very pleased with just kind of that 50 to 60% range. Yeah. I, and Matthew and I were talking about this before you, we joined you here. We both think that often humidity is kind of like a misdiagnosis, right? Like your plant might have yes. issues, but it's not really the humidity that you need to raise 10%. And I think a lot of people uh-huh. are bending up or backward to try to do that. And it's maybe not the issue anyway. Yeah. yeah. It sounds well, like you agree, right? In your experience, Maria. Yeah. I think in general, so the thing that I think is uh, very illuminating talking to you guys is you do such a good job of really understanding all of your plants and where they come from and their natural environment. And so with your plants that live in a high mountain mist scenario, you're going to like double down and figure out how to up their humidity. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, most of our hardy house plants that the majority of us are caring for don't need that. And I feel like a lot of people get very stressed about humidity Mm -hmm. and in the winter and humidity and, oh my God, I have a brown leaf. Now I need to do humidity and I need to up the humidity. And yes, I think added humidity within that 30 to 60 range is going to make plants happier. But I also think that I've never run a humidifier. I've had plants for three years. Mm -hmm. I've had radiators. I've had horrific apartment conditions in New York City and, uh, you know, this old tutor I'm living in now and my plants are still alive. So I think that, I think humidity is a great thing to experiment with. And I'm actually personally really excited to double down and experiment a lot with humidity this year, just because I'm curious about it. And I'm curious to see if my plants would be happier, but Mm -hmm. I think that people shouldn't stress unless they've gotten a jewel orchid or they have a lot of Marantaceae, which are definitely more high humidity loving plants or carnivorous plants are another one. I think in our journeys in plant parenthood, and we just want to do a good job. And and I think it's really easy to feel like you have to buy all these things and you have to make sure, you know, everything is perfect. I think that also like cut yourself a break and learn as you go and experiment. Also something I want to get into is getting those cloches and having like a beauty and the beast moment, you know, where I put some plants under (gasps) a glass cloche. I can like, oh, yeah, let's, let's exactly. But I'm going to experiment with it because I'm curious. And also the plants that I'm going to experiment with have been doing fine. You know, I'm just curious to see if I can have them be better. So I feel like I do have mixed feelings about humidity, but also I'm like very excited to try and up my game. So yeah. I think humidifiers are a big conversation mm-hmm. about plants. I think I've had a couple of moments where just personally as a singer, I've gotten into humidifiers and then I kind of get lazy and I like forget to replace them. And then I kind of stop and then I start up again. And then let's talk about humidifier best practices. Mm -hmm. And I will share a terrifying story of one time how I almost, I I joke, I almost killed me and Billy. Um, I didn't clean, you know, it's so important to clean the humidifiers and I had used it and then I let it dry out. And then I took it out and I didn't clean it and I filled it and I ran it as we were sleeping. And in the middle of the night, like we both woke up kind of choking a little bit, like 
with really tight chests and there had, there was mold that got into the humidifier and I didn't properly clean it. So I learned my lesson that way. I'm definitely not scared of humidifiers. Like I'm still going to do it. It was fully my fault. The the instructions were very clear. (laughs) I just was lazy. This is news to me. I'm glad I'm hearing this because yeah, I just, I don't really have plants that ask for it. So this is interesting to hear. Well, yeah, Steven doesn't use a humidifier. I use one. Yeah, it's not my favorite. I want a top filling one so that I don't have to take the whole thing to like fill it at the sink. Mm -hmm. But you know, every, you know, day or so I'll fill it. And after a little while, it gets like scummy with like this kind of pink, slimy, mildewy yes. mold and then black as well. So anytime that I notice that building up, I scrub it out. It's not that easy. Like there's a lot of nooks and crannies. There's a lot of pieces that can kind of be an issue. A humidifier to me, I'm kind of going to go out on a limb a little bit, but I feel mm-hmm. like if you're just trying to increase your humidity, like 5%, that's not really meaningful. I think that if you can yeah. increase it like 10 to 20%, then it's worth it. And only if your conditions are so dry in the first place, this is useful. But I specifically got the humidifier because even though the majority of my plants were doing fine in the normal humid environments, mm-hmm. I have some specific like begonias, philodendron, oh, yeah. hestatum, silver sword. Like there's a mm-hmm. few of these plants that if the humidity isn't... Mm-hmm pretty high, their leaves are going to grow and deformed or the flowers yeah. don't grow out properly. So yes, great point. The yeah. New growth. Yeah. yeah. Now some people recommend misting to help yes. like ease that through. I think that that does help a little bit with just releasing like a leaf that's trying to come in that might get caught. But Stephen mm-hmm. and I have some complicated feelings about yeah, misting. So and, yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting you bring that up because I, I do do that to these Nepenthes carnivorous plants in particular. People always say, oh, you know what, spray the tips. That will kind of encourage the uh, formation of pitchers. And that seems to work sort of anecdotally in my experience. But when you mist, right, you may temporarily increase the humidity around that plant. But in the whole room, it's that humidity is going to dissipate so quickly right? That it's not going to be meaningful for the plant or last much beyond, you know, the misting you did. And then by the time you've walked away, it's like, well, how much have you really done? Right. So I do do this for orchids. I'll mist orchids because they have, you know, aerial roots, right. And the roots are actually going to take that moisture and suck it up right away. But yeah, Mm -hmm. with uh, leafy tropicals or something, I don't know if I would recommend this really. And I, I I think Matthew agrees, right? Yeah. Not like it's hurting it, but Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of my plants get misted, but it's not for the humidity. It's because these are plants from these tropical ecosystems. They have like thin cells in their leaves to really like allow transpiration to happen. So misting them allows them to take in the water through their foliage. And it's a really useful watering practice for a lot of epiphytes, like some ferns and some orchids. But yeah, I also run the humidifier next to them so that those roots also kind of get baked yeah. in, in the, the humid air to help them take in that water between soaks in the sink. Yeah. So I think even though I just kind of aired my my errors and my my grievances with humidifiers, I think if people want to raise their humidity, humidifiers are definitely the way to go. They're the option where you are going to raise the humidity of an entire room and not just a plant. Regarding misting, I have mixed feelings about it as well, but personally, I love misting my plants because I like. What's well, a great time to check in with yeah, them? <laughs> I like my yeah. misting so practice I just, like, too. Yeah, yeah, I mist for like a meditation, emotional experience almost with my plants, and also it helps yeah. me not overwater because mm-hmm. if I want to visit my plants every day. I can mist and not overwater instead of visiting them and wanting to water their soil every day. Okay. So with humidifiers, I'm excited to try humidifiers this, this winter and go back. I have one humidifier that has, um, essential oils that diffuses into it. I've learned that I, which I love, I love essential oils, but I've also learned, be careful. Don't put it too close to your plant because the oils can clog the pores of the plant, but let's talk best practices for humidifiers. So I think there's like the time old, you know, depending on how your humidifier blows air, like make sure you're not putting it on a wood surface, make sure it's not too close to your floor to like get water collect on your floor. I had Alessia from apartment botanist on a long time ago. And she said to avoid your drywall issue, Matthew, she actually puts like glass panels kind of up against or frames like up against her walls that 
are close to hu- her humidifier. So mm-hmm. the water will collect on the glass or the plastic instead of the wall, which I thought That's a was, great idea. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting hack for renters, you know, who have those security deposits. How do you guys feel? Do you love a warm mist? Do you love a cool mist? Like what are some other practices you guys have found? I've never used one of the warm mist ones. Okay. I like the ultrasonic cool mist. I always, um, I only have one, but like I'm constantly like browsing, like shopping uh-huh. to see if there's like a better one that I'm going to like more. I like the highest capacity possible. I want to be able to fill it and let it run for like a day or two. Yes. If it is like, there's so many really cute ones for like the essential oil yeah. distribution. Yeah. Yeah. My fiance and I have one in the bedroom and I like the combination of lemongrass, eucalyptus and lavender, mm-hmm. but that's not there for the plants. <laughs> that's that's yeah. 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 And so the one that I run in like my main planty living room, uh, I was horrified because we just moved into this house it's like a 1929 like beautiful craftsman tudor style home and and that's very old for seattle we have to point out yeah like these are some of the first houses it has beautiful original hardwood floors and in my old space i had the humidifier sitting on like a little table next to my orchids and hoyas and so it just put the mist into their space because I have my plants grouped very differently in this new room, I just put the humidifier like on the floor. And I did realize like I need to put something under it to keep it from dripping or like water pooling and destroying these floors. Mm -hmm. So I put a plate underneath it and it just ran. We had that period where the whole West Coast was like choking with smoke over the summer. Oh yes, that. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I forgot that was this year. But things were dry and things were hot. So I was running this humidifier on full blast and I'm so glad that I am working from home right now because I went into that room and there was a pool of water. Yeah. You got to be careful. Yeah. Like all that mist was like coming out, but because it was so low to the ground, it wasn't like rising into the air, even though I have a large fan in that room to just kind of circulate air. It just all condensed on the hardwoods. And I, caught it in time. So I was able to wipe it up and there's no damage, thank God. Mm -hmm. But now I have it elevated. Like it is pretty high in the room Mm -hmm. so that like when I water it and fill it, it's actually easier, but it also makes sure that the humidity like rises to the point of the room that the air circulation can kind of pick it up and distribute it Mm -hmm. instead of just having it condense on the leaves, the bookcase, the floor. I think that that's a really important piece. Like have it somewhere that the humidity will enter the room's circulation Mm -hmm. of air. And ideally like close to your plants. I feel like you want to kind of, if you can, if you have one of those humidifiers that you can angle it or wherever you put it, ideally you want that mist getting on those plant leaves or on or close to those leaves instead of just, like you said, pooling on your floor. I always too, when I go into, I've been using humidifiers for my voice forever and Mm -hmm. I, and I always keep a rag next to the humidifier for those moments, just in case, because yeah. they definitely, that's a good tip. or like you kick the humidifier over and then the water <laughs> spills everywhere. Cause that's definitely something I've done too. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're all used to like overwatering a plant to getting pools of water everywhere. So like, yeah. there's a lot of little tips for spilled water in the plant yeah. world. <laughs> those are awesome tips though. I like keeping it high up. I think that's really helpful. And also I love the idea of maybe if you have a bunch of high humidity plants, keeping them together in one area near you, your humidifier. Yeah, this is where all my Marantaceae, a bunch of Syngoniums, a bunch of foliage begonias, like they're all grouped around it. The same room has a lot of cactuses and a lot of succulents, totally. but they're like on the other side of the room in brighter conditions. So I've created like microclimates and then using the little hygrometers, I can go and look and see like, Oh, we're down to 45% humidity. I should go refill this. Go refill. Also, another like easy hack is using your bathroom. If you have yes. um, yeah. if you have a window in your bath, that's my dream for our next home. I cannot wait to have a window mm-hmm. in my bathroom. I've never Holy had one. I have that right now for the first time in my life. Oh. And I'm obsessed. I have bromeliads and hoyas and philodendrons yeah, see, in my bathroom. I have not I been to his it. house yet, right? Because it's like quarantine times. So I'm curious. Steve and I God. see each other almost never yeah, in real I'm life. curious to see that, uh, you know, when we can all, you know, see each other again. But something about growing plants in kitchens and bathrooms, it's not really a myth, but I want to kind of mention this. People always say that those are the most humid rooms in your house. Mm-hmm. And yes, they are when you are showering or boiling pasta. Right. You know, like if... I I have a guest bathroom in my house that 
probably is no more Never humid than used. any other zone. Yeah, no mm-hmm. one has showered in it. Since and I mean, we moved right, in. not to name any names, but it's quarantine. People are probably showering a little bit less, right? So maybe it's not. <laughs> I know I that I have. <laughs> so you can edit this out. Yeah. I Wait, love that. It, there was this meme that we saw about like, you know, you may as well start growing cactus in your bathroom mm. right now with how infrequently it's being humid. But uh, bathrooms are great as long as you have the light. I think that it's very sad when someone here is like, oh, this is a really great bathroom plant. And then you inevitably see the photo on a Facebook yeah. house plant group like, what's happening to my Calathea? They said put it in a bathroom. I'm like, you don't have a window in your uh, bathroom. Yeah. That's why it's not doing yeah. well. <laughs> but you could put some grow lights in there. Billy won't let me put, I, we had a no windows in our bathroom for three years in New York City uh-huh. and he wouldn't let me put a grow light in because I get it. He was nervous. It's a wet, you know, I'm glad yeah. it's a wet place. He didn't want more cords where there didn't need to be. But I was like, but it would look so cool if we put a modern, you know, a modern sprout grow frame or a grow house. Like how cool would that look? And he was like, you have enough plants. Go. I think that, room. <laughs> yeah, Billy and my Brian can start like they should group. start their, they own, start podcast, their own podcast right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> how to live with people like Steve and right. Maria and the other side right <laughs> we should give them a yeah. guest episode of just mm-hmm. like we don't even show up to the interview we just let them like bitch it's about just us them. For yeah. <laughs> special oh God, seven hilarious. hour episode yeah <laughs> i love that i'll show that um, to take it personally when i listen <laughs> exactly <laughs> we'll have to drink we'll, we'll have a listening party mm-hmm. together with a drink mm-hmm. or something <laughs> perfect <laughs> One closing thought that I have, though, about humidity is that it's really necessary for a lot of plants, but I think that having a really good watering game and a good substrate for strong root health is going to largely ease the humidity concerns that that you might have. Like, I have this maidenhair fern that I do nothing to increase its humidity, but it's planted in a method and technique that it has never crisped up its foliage just because it has that water availability. So Hmm. if humidity is a concern for you uh, because the humidity is actually low, then you should try to increase it. But if your humidity is in that range that we're talking about and you're still seeing some crisping, I would recommend maybe considering like a lighter, fluffier potting soil that you can water more regularly without rotting the roots or just finding some other strategy that might help the plant take up water without having to rely so much on the ambient humidity to keep its respiration and the transpiration like strong and positive. And, you know, you can still have beautiful plants that traditionally want high humidity, even if they're just kind of sitting on a windowsill like any other normal thing. I freaking love that. And I know that if people are more curious, I know that you are a soil scientist, soil mad scientist with the different substrates you always are researching and and collecting. So, you know, definitely go check out the Plant Daddy podcast for more nerdy deep dives with these two because it's been so much fun. I've really enjoyed talking with you guys. I hope we have more of these conversations in the future. Final thoughts on winter, you know, seasons are okay. Don't get stressed. Mm -hmm. Do what you can. Get curious. Experiment. Yeah. One thing we didn't talk about, I will link a YouTube video I've released with my kind of my first experience using those hygrometers, which are the things that measure humidity that that these advanced plant parents have been talking about. But do you guys have any like quick best practices for measuring humidity and keeping tabs on it? Do you just like check ever so often? Anything like that? Any brands you like? Gosh, you know, I don't know the brands offhand, but I feel like you can get a lot of uh, really cheap options that are great. Like they, so I don't think there's any necessarily any need to go top of the line with this. Um, I do know that some are now Bluetooth connected. They can, you know, spit out charts for you if you are really curious about like the daily swings. But many that I have around my house, they'll just tell you what the peak was for the day and what the trough was, like the lowest level. And that's been enough for me for really all of my plants so far. I would like some charts though. So we'll see. Yeah. Maybe I'll get some for Christmas. I also just like ones that have the the maximum and the minimum of both humidity and temperature, because that way, yeah. you know, if I'm not there to look at it, I might know like, oh crap, this room got down to 30% for hours today. Oh, that and I you didn't can backtrack. Realize. Okay. Yeah. That's like inter- that's- you can research that way. Interesting. Yeah. And especially with plants that want a little bit of like drop in temperature at night, like it's a good way to just kind of make sure that you're giving your your plants the best experience. But my personal best practice is that I just found 
a few that were like pretty inexpensive on Amazon. You can also buy them at a lot of plant shops and like garden centers and stuff. But I like just leaving them like Stephen does in different zones so that I can see like, this is what my succulents are doing. This is what their Mm -hmm. humidity is like. This is what this room is like. And then like every time I'm going through and just caring for plants, I'm just in the habit of always glancing at them. And it's really easy to just check in and just kind of monitor. It's really low key. I'm excited to like go ham. I have four right now. I've got two different brands that I'm playing Mm -hmm. with and I want to stick them in the bathroom and the living room and I want to just get curious and just keep learning in that way. Oh, it just helps you understand your zones. Totally. Yeah. And like, actually, I, I have no idea what my humidity of my home is right now. You know, I'm excited to, to get a better understanding of that, even just for my lung health and my body health Mm -hmm. too, in addition to my plant health. Yeah. Wooden furniture appreciates having more than a dry atmosphere. Totally. Totally. So where can we go find you and hang out with you, Arlie? and get to know you guys more. I can't recommend checking the plant daddies out enough. I've really enjoyed listening to your show lately, especially oh, I loved you. your um, bird of paradise is like my next dream plant ooh, in our next home. Ooh, I've always yeah. wanted one. I've never had the space. I want like a six footer. I want like a big old, you know, white bird of paradise yeah. one day. And uh, it, I really enjoyed listening to you guys talk about it because it just oh, got me you. excited of like vision boarding it. Great. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, if you get a three foot tall one, it'll be six feet tall real soon. I know. I know. And monitor it for pests. Don't let them take cold. A hundred percent. So yes, where can everyone go find you and listen to that episode and all your other episodes? Um, Any of your favorite podcast players, uh, you can find us on social media, Plant Daddy Podcast, pretty much everywhere. But yeah, we're really active on Instagram. We also always have our show notes and some relevant photos on our website, which is plantdaddypodcast.com. And we recently added a merch shop. We've been excited to launch that. So you can find that through our website as well. Uh, We're just really excited about the community that we're connected with on social media. So we're pretty active on it. I love that. And I love the voice that you're bringing. I mean, you guys say you're intersectional horticulture, right? That's kind of your tagline. Yeah, I love the people who grow plants as much as I love the plants. And we just want to represent like as many different ways of being a plant parent as you can be. Yes. And also LGBTQ culture and pop culture and everything else that you're bringing to your podcast and your space too. It's yeah. it's awesome that you're here and representing. And I, I've really enjoyed getting to know you guys and I can't wait to have you on in the future. So thanks. Oh, it's been so fun. Oh, so fun. And everyone go check them out. All the links will be in the show notes. Thank you so much to these fabulous Plant Daddies again for that epic conversation. Head over to the Plant Daddy podcast, subscribe, check their stuff out, and you will definitely see me as a guest on their show sometime soon as well. And we had such a fun conversation on their show. They asked me questions I've never been asked in other podcasts, and we just had the best time. They're really awesome guys, so go check them out. And also, they just launched their merch store. The link is in the show notes, so check out that cute Plant Daddy merch. I love it. Also, so you guys know, I've gotten real curious about humidity and I went to Instagram and I polled you guys about which hygrometers you guys use. Those are the little things that measure humidity in your homes and also uh, moisture meters. And I did a little review of two different brands of hygrometers and two different types of moisture meters. They are on the YouTube show in case you want to check out my review. If you're interested in learning more about those devices, you can click the link in the show notes. And last but not least, I'm starting a new thing where at the end of my podcast episodes, I'm going to introduce you to some other podcasts, mostly outside of the plant space that I enjoy and love. And I think it's just a fun way to keep you guys subscribing and introducing you to other fun content that I like to listen to. So at the end of my episodes, I'll be playing trailers of different podcasts that I think you might enjoy. So first up is Pull It Together by Alex Mateo. Alex is actually a friend of mine from the performing space. She is a performer turned podcaster and has put together together this really fun podcast. It's for women redefining what it means to be creative in their own terms. I was a guest on her show in 2020, and oh my God, we had the most powerful, intense conversation (laughs) about creativity, about manifesting, about flow, and the Bloom and Grow radio journey, but performing, and just all things. She has such interesting conversations with really interesting people on her show, so I highly suggest you go check her out, and you can listen to the trailer right now. 
This is where I leave you, plant friends. So until next time, keep blooming and keep growing. I don't want to... I don't even know if edgy is the right word. It's like a bohemian version of goop, but in like a sexy New York way. Cool. Which is very much my like dream aesthetic. Hey everyone, Alex Mateo here. Welcome to Pull It Together, where I talk with women who are redefining what it means to be creative on their own terms. Uh, and listen, creatives, we are creatives because we see the world and we're like, something is off here. Mm-hmm. And I want to offer a different perspective. How do I fuck that up and how do I continue to fuck that up, right? It can come in a different form and it can still be good. I've been a professional actor for almost a decade now. And as I approached my Saturn return, I realized I was giving away a lot of my power, specifically when it came to my creativity. And I'd find myself turning to my girlfriends, my tribe, whether that was to vent or get some perspective. And it really got me thinking about the importance of community and how much people gain from just having a conversation. There's a certain type of person that has the gut drive to live in a city like New York City. And when you go out of the city, you're not necessarily meeting those like-minded people as easily as you would. And at that same time that we move, like my social ecosystem changed, and I took to Instagram. On this pod, we're going to have frank, funny, honest conversations with women who are breaking the mold and debunking myths of being a creative. And it made me realize, you know, as artists, especially when we have that type of personality of perfectionism and self-bashing, sometimes we feel like our work has to be so perfect to touch. Mm -hmm. And then when you put something that's imperfect and it still touches people, it's like, it's pretty like powerful. I think that there's like this illusion that because you are sharing something on a platform and a lot of people follow you, that you're this like magical expert. So grab some coffee or wine and whatever feels like it's falling apart. We'll pull it together. Oh yeah. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks guys. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and growradio.com slash personality and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes, usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. <laughs>